Welcome to Contrasense, a podcast focusing on the social sciences and research currently done in them. Today uh, it's uh, Maria and uh, Matei and we'll be discussing um, something um, of great importance. <laughs> it's basically life uh, important because we'll be discussing birth uh, practices. And our guest today is Neda Deneva, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of uh, Babes Boje in Cluj and uh, also at the New Europe College in Bucharest. Her research interests are in the field of migration and labor practices, but she's also doing this really interesting uh, research on bird practices in Eastern Europe and particularly Bulgaria and Romania. Hi, Neda. Hey. Hi, both of you. I'm really excited to do this with you because we've been waiting so long to interview. <laughs> It's on me, the wait. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, but now we have the opportunity to talk about this research that before you you weren't doing it last year. So now it's um, it's even it's even better. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, just uh, some general things about how you began researching this and what are you looking at. Okay, great. I'm very happy to be able to talk about it because this is a slightly different field than what I've been working on until now. So it's very nice to explore my voice on these issues as an uh, upcoming uh, researcher in this field. I got interested in the topic basically more than 10 years ago through listening to my friends who started giving birth in uh, Bulgaria in state hospitals and they started having pretty unpleasant experience in it. And then at the same time, I had other friends who were living abroad in the Netherlands and in the UK and their experience of uh, childbirth was coming from a different planet. So I wanted to make sense of these two types of completely different experience taking place at the same time inside Europe. And I started following uh, different stories, but also they uh, in Bulgaria there were different waves of uh, mobilization of different groups. Initially, the topic was more about uh, the right to home birth and to medical attendance uh, during home birth, which is still not legal in Romania and Bulgaria. It's not? It's not. You can give birth at home as a person, but uh, you can't have medical assistance. People sh go to jail if they are actually attending births as medical persons. So this topic was kind of uh, important for a while and it got connected also to a case in Hungary with a doctor and midwife who was attending illegally Uh, home births as an alternative to the bad practices that were taking place in state hospitals, Agnes Gereb, and she got caught by the police. She was reported by someone, she got caught, she was in jail, she was under home arrest for two years, and her case was open for a very long period, and only recently they closed the case with a bad sentence of two years of jail and uh, 10 years of uh, ban on uh, uh, her practicing which then the president gave her a clemency on, but the, out, the legal outcome is still quite unfavorable. So this was a topic in Eastern Europe for quite some time. And in Bulgaria, there was an organization that was trying to fight for this, to see what changes can uh, take place along these lines. So this is where my interest initially mm -hmm. started. I was just following what's going on. And in this process, I realized 10 years later, looking back, that actually quite many things have changed. They seem like small things, but changes in medical practices, this is a very conservative uh, field. So changes take place slowly. And it's actually quite impressive that even in state hospitals, you have things that have been transforming. So based on this more personal interest, I also established some friendships with people who work in the field, who became in the meantime midwives, doulas, lactation consultants. I started following some uh, Facebook discussion groups on these issues. And finally, I managed to connect this personal interest with uh, my other field of study, which is migration studies, um, by trying to make a connection between mobile medical professionals and transformations in the field of uh, bird giving and maternal and child care uh, more wildly, more broadly. And this is how I got a fellowship in Bulgaria in the Center for Advanced Studies to study this issue on Bulgaria. And now I'm continuing at the New York College in Bucharest with a similar research on Romania. Mm -hmm. So this is the 
long story of how I got to the topic. You were saying earlier about how you managed to uh, like mix these two interests, like your main research interest and this interest in, in uh, natality. Could you develop a little bit more on that, on uh, birth giving practices met face to face with uh, the like labor migration? Yeah, I think basically the connection is contained in labor. <laughs> in English, it works well yeah. because it's <laughs> labor, yeah. labor. But uh, the way I uh, saw the connection is that there is this concept of social remittances in uh, migration studies, quite an old concept by now, which is not just about migrants sending money back, so financial remittances, but they also send experience back, different practices. So some return migrants come back and start doing things differently in their home countries or just based on the experience that they have, they might influence a positive or a negative change, whatever the field is. So I kept thinking about these things during my uh, work on uh, labor migration and how people start changing their ideas of what not only their general lives are, but also what, how do they work how do they perform in, at their workplace, how do they engage with uh, their trajectories, their um, work trajectories, their careers. Um, and this made me think of what, ha what would happen if medical professionals who already went abroad came back. How would they bring back knowledge? How does transfer of knowledge happen through this change of uh, the context of labor. Um, so from low-skilled labor, I moved to high-skilled labor, but the logic is uh, very similar. How the experience that you get somewhere else in a different context, in a different setting, in different institutional culture, then makes you behave professionally in a different way when you go back to the country where you uh, started from. And uh, a very important thing here is that I started looking at people who practiced, so medical professionals, mostly doctors, because they are the return, the few return migrants, uh, midwives or uh, nurses do not come back for now, sadly, uh, for financial reasons. But doctors do, some of them, after specialization or after working for a few years, they see an opportunity to actually have a meaningful and good life back in their home countries, Romania or uh, Bulgaria. So they do come back. But I focused on people who actually practiced in countries where bird giving is very different than in Bulgaria and Romania, exactly to see how do they make sense of these differences, how do they come to terms with these two very different systems of care, of medical care. Can you, can you, can you expand on first what these countries are, how the two different systems are well different, and also if the number of returning uh, medical professionals is significant Yes, good. Okay, so the second question, the number is not significant in terms of numbers, but because my hypothesis was that these are very influential people with higher uh, status or so doctors as opposed to uh, lower medical professionals clearly have a higher status, so they could bring about change. They also come back with the knowledge and the higher status just because they were somewhere else in other Western countries. This is usually mm -hmm. uh, the direction that they go, uh, but also because they come with uh, more money, if you wish. I mean, they most of them already have more money to start a private practice. They have connections and so on. So they come in a position of power, so to say, and they come as people who've practiced somewhere And they can bring back not just the knowledge that some practices exist somewhere, but they can say, I've been part of these practices and I know they work. So let's see now what we can do here. This was my hypothesis mm -hmm. that even though the numbers are not high, they are significant people. The reality, unfortunately, is slightly different. And uh, we'll get to that, to what extent doctors actually get involved in uh, the process of birth back in Bulgaria and Romania. But before that, just to uh, go back to your first question with um, what are the differences, which are the countries and what are mm -hmm. the main differences? So I'm uh, interested in countries like the UK and the Netherlands and Germany, which have better outcomes on many of the recommendations of the World Health Organization and in generally take seriously evidence-based medicine, which means that they, their health professionals, but also their uh, institutions, health institutions or the Ministry of Health and different committees, take seriously the development of medicine and they develop guidelines 
based on the newest uh, research. Evidence-based medicine has its uh, flaws, and we can discuss this a bit later, but the aim is to produce newer and newer research, which would allow people to evolve and improve the way they practice, people, professionals. So in countries like um, the UK, there are guidelines for uh, birth giving, which each and every professional, each and every hospital should follow their medical standards. And these medical standards and guidelines get updated on a regular basis. Doctors get trainings on a regular basis. Also, Switzerland is, a, is such a country. So they get trained and retrained being introduced to new recommendations, new developments, and so on, as opposed to Bulgaria and Romania, where education is based on textbooks written in some cases in the 1950s or in the 1970s. And after that, there are no guidelines. The medical standards don't contain too much actual information on how you should go about a particular medical process, at least in uh, the field of birth giving. There are no hospital protocol, protocols very often, so the way doctors practice is based on their own experience and the, and the experience of their colleagues, which is not necessarily in itself a bad thing, but it could be a bad thing if the experience is locked in a paradigm written in the 50s. And things have changed a lot between the 1950s and now. So to give you a few examples, the bird giving woman should not be considered as a patient until there is a complication. Then medical care should put the birth giving woman in the center of care and should take seriously her knowledge of her body, but also her participation in the process, her active participation, as opposed to her being treated as a patient to whom things are being done. Even the language in Bulgarian is that the doctor gives birth to the baby. is mm -hmm. a instead of the woman birthing the baby. So this language is very significant because it uh, forms the way people practice and they understand their general roles in this uh, process. So this is like the old paradigm where the, the doctor... The woman is the patient, the doctor takes decisions and tells her what to do. And this has all sorts of different implications. For example, are women going to uh, push in a directed way at the third stage of, uh, at the second stage of birth giving when the contractions are, are about pushing the baby out. Women can be told how to push, to count, to, to push three times during a contraction, to count to 10 during each push and so on. This is what we see in the movies very often. Or they can be encouraged to push whenever they feel the urge to push. This second version is what is being recommended by different uh, organizations and uh, research shows that this uh, brings uh, better outcomes. But as you can imagine, in Bulgaria and Romania, directed pushes are the norm. So this is one uh, place where you see how the role of the woman is not considered, even physically, she's not considered as someone who has the authoritative knowledge to know what's going on. This is only one example, how she deals with contractions, whether she's allowed to walk around, to take different positions, which might feel comfortable, as opposed to, sit, to lying uh, in a reclined position on a table with the legs up in front of the doctor who tells her what to do, and so on. So there are very many different aspects. We can talk in more mm -hmm. details if you want. But um, the main principle is who is in the center of the, of the care and in what way. And it's a lot about power relations. It's a lot about hierarchies in which in the one paradigm you have the hospital, which is a institution of expertise and of knowledge of trained professionals who then take care of the patient, but also tell the patient what to do, as opposed to an institution in which those who know care, so they're caretakers, which also includes allowing the patient autonomy to take decisions, but also making sure that the patient or the person being taken care of, in this case the woman, understands the process. So they make sure that they explain exactly what's going on and then allow the woman to take power of her own uh, body and of what's going on. This is the kind of uh, general uh, opposition that you can see. 
Because I, I can see why this experience can feel kind of alienating. If you are treated like a patient in this, this position, it uh, might feel... It just ends up feel, feeling very, very badly. And I, I kind of stumbled upon um, recently upon talking to two gynecologists separately. And both of them had this view that, uh, well, the woman, she should trust the doctor, like exactly what you said. And in a sense, uh, it feels like uh, it's also a gender issue. But uh, in their case, and they were both male, I I felt it was more likely to be explained by the fact that they they were professional trained uh, medical people and they knew how it's supposed to be done and well they the women just have to they were like patients in in that I think that's the most interesting thing about birth that it's not a no it's not the usual medical event in most of the other cases you have a problem your body malfunctions in some way and you go to the professional to solve it whether through a surgery or through medication or through something else. With birth, if all goes well, it's a natural process where the body can do its job without support. You can give birth by yourself fully if everything is fine. Medical help is there to intervene in case of a complication or in situations in which there is high risk, we already know. So doctors hospitals, medical personnel are there to save women's and children's lives in a case of complication. But they have dis unlearned, so they have lost the ability to recognize that there are many cases when there is no complication. So the rate of C-section shows this very clearly. C-section saves lives, right? So before C-section existed as a safe medical procedure, women just died or babies died. But the recommended rate for C-sections is 15%. In Bulgaria and Romania, we have close to 50%. This for is a, all births? Yes. This is 50% of all births are C-sections. This would mean that Bulgarian and Romanian women have severe physical problems much higher, on a much higher rate than the average population, the world population, if they need so much intervention. Or it could mean that this intervention is uh, without a basis, without a medical basis, that there are other explanatory factors for why the rate is so high. So in principle, for those 15%, the medical intervention saves their lives. But the other 35%, why do they have to go through this? It's a medical operation, it's a surgery, it's a shock for the body in a different way than the physiological process of birth giving is. So I think birth is this one thing that is both a medical event and not and a natural event. And it's very difficult, I fully understand how it is difficult to be a doctor who is trained to intervene and to solve problems, who has to just observe and decide, do I, am I needed here or not? In Bulgaria and Romania, I feel that doctors very often feel that they don't do their job properly unless they intervene. And this is not the fault of a particular person. It's the way the educational system and the institutional medical culture works in general. Of course, this is a generalization, yeah. and there are all sorts of exceptions of uh, doctors who don't uh, work that way, but... Uh, This is the trend. Actually, I remember my conversation with uh, this uh, person asked him why he wanted to be, why he chose to be a gynecologist. Um, and he said something like, well, it's um, interesting enough. It's like not boring, but it's also like uh, it has all these other benefits of being paid well and other stuff. Like it's not one of those things that are just boring and you don't do anything. <laughs> and it's like... Um, Also, this something about the use of skill. He also said something like he gets to use his skills. So this brings us back, I think, to the question of the substantial numbers of returning uh, medical specialists and what is their role, because this is how my research started. And then, unfortunately, what I got to discover is that even those doctors who came back and started practicing in the uh, delivery unit Many of them gave up, they stepped out and they started doing other uh, medical uh, 
activities like phytomorphology, which is monitoring and it has to do with technology and using particular set of skills or working in assisted reproduction like IVF and so on. And uh, one of the doctors with whom I discussed who was working in a delivery unit in a private hospital and then he stepped out, he explained, well, he worked in Slovenia, so it's not even the perfect West of uh, developed uh, medical practices, but in Slovenia, the, this was a joke, <laughs> in uh, Slovenia, uh, bird giving, uh, the bird giving process follows more closely the, the current guidelines. So there he was called in the delivery room only when there was a complication, when there was a problem. He learned a lot from the midwives and the midwives themselves had the autonomy to recognize when a birth giving process turns into a complication and uh, extra medical intervention is needed. But in the rest of the time, he didn't need to be present in the delivery room. So for these many hours during which a woman was giving birth, his medical skill was used somewhere else, whether to do research or to attend more complicated cases and so on. When he came b- back to Bulgaria, what because he became famous for the doctor with whom you can give birth uh, naturally without too much intervention unless it's necessary so many women started choosing him for this and not because he's a specialist in more complicated cases and his job was to basically sit in the delivery room and make sure that no one else interferes to so make sure were that the midwives like yes to make sure that the midwives are doing their job Well, he's just there, literally sitting in a corner at a desk, looking at his phone. And when his colleagues would enter and ask, so what's going on? Is there progress? Uh, are you doing something? Like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. At that point, he said, what I also told you earlier, I think it's a very good quote. I, I'm not interested in being a janitor, guarding the birding woman and the midwife from doing their job, guarding them from my colleagues who might want to intervene. This is not interesting for me. I want to be used where I'm needed. I want to develop my professional skills. I I just went to a training on how to use a vacuum for in a better way. And I want to do this, but I want to be called when there is ne- a need of me. And this is very understandable that when you trained to solve problems, you want to solve problems. And at the same time, he was recognizing that he shouldn't solve problems where there are no problems. So the end result is that many of these doctors actually realize that they have no place in the delivery room in the way it's structured, the system is structured in uh, in our countries. And they chose an alternative uh, field, an alternative career, basically. But in Bulgaria and Romania, they are required to be in the room? No, they're not required, but they're the ones who officially uh, lead the birth process. They're the ones who sign at the end, the responsibility is with them. So very often doctors are there um, and are the ones who take decisions. And this is also the reason why they want to speed up the process. They have more women or they have little time, their shift is over, or they just panic that things are taking too long, even though there is not necessarily an indication and they want to do things, to interfere, to, to make the connection of, uh, of my current uh, hypothesis. Because doctors are not that visible in this field, those returning doctors who potentially could have brought uh, back change, basically now my uh, argument is that it's about the autonomy of the midwives. It's about the, the medical field as such, the different medical professionals recognizing the role of the midwife who is the one who should attend a normal, uncomplicated, low-risk birth. She's the one who has the skills, how to recognize what's going on, to support the woman, in, to suggest different positions without interfering in a doctor-like uh, uh, way, which is not the case at all. Midwives have very low status and very low uh, level of... Uh, they're not really allowed to take too many decisions as it is now in Bulgaria and Romania, as compared to their colleagues in the UK and in uh, the Netherlands and in Germany. So this is something that could bring about positive change, the role of the medical specialist who should attend normal birth. And this shouldn't be the doctor. The doctor should be there just in case. So I'm curious as to what you think the reasons for this 
huge divide between paradigms in these countries is what what do you think is behind that that why do you think our countries are just lost in in a paradigm that as you were saying comes from the like 50s such a big question yeah that's the most difficult question <laughs> well depending on whom you ask the answers vary a lot so one very easy answer that many of the people that i interviewed have is This is remnants from the socialist times. We did, we didn't manage to uh, change. We inherited the Soviet system, and now we don't know how to step out of it. I think this is a bit simplistic. First of all, because the Soviet system was the same also in the UK, where simply change happened earlier in the 70s. But before that, things were very similar. It was about medicalization. It was about uh, progress this was the more machines the more interventions was considered the better way of uh, taking care of patients so i don't think that this is the explanation but i don't really have an answer because we have countries like uh, estonia which started at the exact same rates with bulgaria and romania in the early 90s and now in one of the biggest and most and busiest hospitals in the capital city the practices are at the level of a great uh, British hospital with uh, up-to-date care and uh, uh, close to the recommendations of the WHO and so on. So it can't be socialism because why did it develop differently in the in two countries which otherwise had similar uh, past? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I really don't know. It's about relations between professions But I have no explanation why things are not changing. So until recently, uh, in uh, Romania and Bulgaria, the midwives had... Uh, so there was no official education for midwives until 2004 in Romania. And in Bulgaria, it was this semi-professional for two years. And then because of the EU, both countries had to have proper BA education for four years, also in midwifery. So... This was introduced, but in a bit of a administrative way, which didn't necessarily incorporate any new skills and, 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 and knowledge. And it certainly didn't change the status of the, of the midwives. In Bulgaria and Romania, midwives are with the status of nurses, so they're considered auxiliary personnel, which is not exactly the case. Midwives are should be autonomous medical specialists which don't need to work under the guideline guiding of of doctors within their particular field but this is not the case and i think that this is part of the of the problem that's why i i see, I see the change happening only through the profession also becoming autonomous if doctors don't trust their uh, if they don't even think of midwives as colleagues And if they don't trust them, if women don't trust midwives as medical specialists, then natural birth just or physiological birth just can't happen because you rely on the wrong specialist. But what is at the core of this, uh, this unequal relations? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> But it feels it's so much about who has the um, expertise, right? I mean, who knows who who you can trust to know something and also if someone knows what does it mean for for the for the patient or the woman if somebody knows what, how much can it, can this person know about uh, the patient and in in one sense i'm thinking this is like a whole um, medical enterprise that uh, that is relevant in all of the medical practices the fact that the patient is treated um, maybe from this very expertise scientific point of view mm -hmm. or the fact that he or she is treated with care but li like you said in the birth giving it's different but i also feel it has to do with the whole field and then i from what i remember i read something about the fact that um i don't know how recently but there's also this maybe paradigm about the the patient as a client mm -hmm. so this is something else it's not the patient as uh, somebody sub subservient or somehow some, somebody that just listens uh, and does what the doctor says but the patient as somebody who it ha it has the autonomy but should choose everything and know everything for for herself 
and uh, also like treat everything in maybe in an economical manner. So this is the patient as a client. And then what you're talking about is the patient as um, a person who's being taken care of, I think. I think uh, it, it might have to do with all these institutional practices and also with, I don't know, economical ways mm -hmm. of doing things. I think this is at the core of it. How do we call the patient so that the patient is not just a passive recipient of procedures? Because patient, that's what, that's what it means, someone who passively takes in whatever, care or intervention or whatever. And it is a linguistic issue, but then when you, the opposition of patient is client, this is also quite problematic because the client buys services, buys. So there is a somehow inherent idea of financial exchange, which I find very problematic when we talk of uh, healthcare or in general, if you wish, but in healthcare, It should be about care and it should be available for everyone, irrelevant of whether they could pay or not. But also, it's not a shop. You do go to the specialists to take care of you, but we don't have a word in, in, in Bulgarian even more complicated than in English for the person who is taken care of. S simply, we don't have the noun to... Uh, to use. And I think this is very problematic because on one hand, because care would involve more than just doing things to your body. It would mean also explaining, making sure that the person understands, allowing for the person to take decisions in an informed way. This is at the core usually of the whole issue with the woman being in the center of care, that if a medical specialist specialist explains in a clear way what is going on and why do they think is important to do something, a particular intervention, in 90% of the cases, the woman would agree. If a woman is just being disregarded, if people talk over her head and they take decisions over her head, then this makes her feel disempowered. But this is the case for all patients. As a patient, you can refuse care. And as a patient, you have the you should have the right to be explained in simple, clear language what's going on. Of course, the one who explains always selects the way in which they explain, and they can stir the um, the kind of information in such a way that they convince. But even this is this is not the issue yet. This is missing. Whether you go to the hospital for a surgery or for treating of uh, cancer, or we'll go to give birth, you're not explained things. You're not told what's going on and why people do it. And with cancer treatment, there are different ways of doing things. And in different countries, in different hospitals, doctors do it differently. So you should be explained why what they recommend to you, they think is the best uh, way of doing it. But instead, what you get as a patient or as anyone who enters a hospital is... We studied here for 10 years. You don't have medical knowledge, so you have no right of opinion. And when it comes to birth, this is very strong. I don't want doctors, I don't want women who read on the internet. The internet is this black, horrible place where you can read things. <laughs> to be honest, medical abstracts are much more clear to read by a, a sociologist than sociological abstracts. I mean, it's straightforward. We did these tests. These were our hypotheses. These are the conclusions. This is what we discovered, full stop. So, you know, of course, I don't claim that you don't need medical education in order to uh, understand, but you could be explained things. And this is at the core of this opposition between patient and client, because as a client, you can say, well, I don't like the service that you provide. I go somewhere else. But it shouldn't go that far as to call someone a client in order to get this kind of approach in which... And, and there is a concept, actually, that uh, uh, talks about this. is called authoritative knowledge. And the question is who holds the authoritative knowledge, whether it's doctors, whether it's midwives, whether it's women. Do women know what is going on with their body? Very often, in this medicalized version, the doctor says, I know, I see on the monitor how your contractions are. Now you should do this. And the woman says, I don't feel like it. It doesn't come 
naturally or I'm afraid or it's too early and then there could be a conflict. But then the other approach is like, okay, we wait. If the baby is fine, if you're fine, we wait. Then we see how things develop. So these are two very different, mm -hmm. um, two very different approaches. Yeah, I just remember what this person said. He said something regarding uh, why are there so many C-sections in Romania? And he said, well, sometimes they're necessary, sometimes it's safer, sometimes, well, even physical natural birth is not that safe because if you have to do use a forceps or something else, it can also be very dangerous. And well, sometimes women just don't want to push. Well, yeah, but there are ways to encourage them to push. I mean, this is a very shared uh, approach. Well, women are spoiled, they shout too much, they can't uh, tolerate pain, they don't know how to push, so we have to do it for them. It's not about C-sections, it's about other interventions during uh, during birth. But it's your role as a doctor to explain why is it, or as a medical uh, specialist, why is it important to do it now. To give you an example from the, we didn't talk about the, the midwives that I'm, I did research on in Bulgaria, but to give you an example from what they do, When they feel that the woman is too tired and uh, she is in a position that is not very productive, their job is to encourage her to change the position, to walk around, to stand, to be on all fours, to change from what she was doing until now. This is not directing her how to do things, but it's suggesting different options because they know, because they have the experience, because they've learned this. She doesn't know. But they make sure that they explain why is it important to try different ways in order to make progress. So that's a way in which they interfere, but it's uh, very different than lie down on, on your back and push when I tell you to push, right? So it could be interference, it could be uh, guidance, but it very much depends on how exactly you, you do it. If you don't mind, I'd I'd uh, like to take a step back, and um, I was curious how how you about how you approached this subject methodologically. It sounds like a pretty tricky, fuzzy area, and um, yeah, could you could you develop on that a little? I think that's a very important question. Uh, as we discussed a little bit earlier, it's a very tricky field because it's a very small field where people know each other. And you can't really anonymize people. You can't have large samples. You can't have representative samples in any way. Um, but so this makes it on one hand skew, sk skewed and biased. I talk on the case of Bulgaria about these two midwives who are the first to establish their independent midwifery unit and who work in a different way. They still work with doctors in a private hospital, but they work in a different way consistently as compared to other hospitals, other doctors, other uh, midwives. They are just these two women. So when I write about change and I write about their practices, it's very clear that it's them. You can't just say, well, it's one of the five units that work like this that I described. So that's one thing that you have very small sample of uh, respondents, of research partners. Um, but the other problem is that, and you know, here the justification is that they are uh, making a difference. They are agents of change because this is the interest that I have. How does change happen and who are the people, who are the different positions that uh, come together and work together in certain types of uh, strategic cooperation, which brings about change. And I think that's fine if there are a few people. Although revolution would always be a better option, but, uh, you know, we are getting there. Uh, so that's uh, that's one of the issues. But the other issue is that when you have so few people, they're not only recognizable in your research, but also you, as a researcher, have a very strong responsibility on what do you say about them, how do you phrase what you say in a way that it's not in any way um, harmful for them. So do you share too much information that might have been uh, private, that might have, if it was anonymous, it wouldn't have mattered. But when we know exactly whom we are talking about, it's uh, more problematic. And also how the wording or the analysis or even the critical reflection might affect the actual process. So what... I struggle with a lot and I find so difficult to, to put in writing is this 
two fields of analysis and activism. Even though I'm not personally involved in the activism that they do, I'm very supportive of what they do because I believe that there is a need of change happening. Whether I fully agree with every single step that they do as a person, as a, as a scholar, that's a different thing. But the overall process is something very important in my opinion. So then I have to be very careful in the way that I write about them so that I don't stop the process in any way, so that I don't create harm rather than Help support it, them yeah, and uh, popularize. And I think this is an issue, uh, as we also discussed earlier, in many different fields. Uh, but when you have also recognizable partners in your research, that's, that makes it even more difficult because you also bear this personal responsibility for particular uh, people. In a way, maybe it's easier to write about people that you don't like and about uh, processes that you uh, disapprove of and you cri criticize. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> easier because you're not so conflicted. You're not conflicted, yes. So that's part of it. But uh, I don't think that this should stop us from, from doing the research. I think the way to go about it is to involve your to really think of them as your research partners and to involve them as much as uh, you can as a researcher in the final conclusions, in the findings, so to have this back and forth process in which you keep discussing, which also is useful for the actual findings. So, for example, if I'm bothered by an issue and I go back to one of these people with whom now I uh, have a social life as well, I can ask these extra questions and then it turns out that their position is not as problematic as I initially thought, but or they themselves think more about it, like, okay, maybe you're right, we should consider also other things and so on. So it's a process that actually is constructive in, in practice as well, not just in, in the way of being sure that you don't say something wrong. But it's, uh, it's very challenging. It's a very uh, different uh, way of doing things for me as uh, opposed to before. Yeah, I mean, I I can imagine it's incredibly difficult if you have personal relationships with these people, but also just being trying to understand the practice or being critical of it is um, is it difficult in the, in a way that maybe these people they plan to do something, but then because of several reasons they end up doing something else in a little bit, and then it would it would not be like. A, would not be enough you were just critical of what they, that they ended up doing because that's not what they planned out to do you, you need we always need to look at like all the factors that are involved yeah but it also pushes me to rethink of how in general i do research because when i have this personal responsibility of not making a wrong interpretation because people would see and know when they know me and i know them Uh, then it also makes me think, okay, did I do the same thing when I was doing research in a village that I anonymized with people that would probably never read what I wrote in English? You know, I can go back and tell them what I'm writing, but my articles won't really be of interest for them. And then it's much easier to just exaggerate, overinterpret, you know, misunderstand something, misinterpret something just because you didn't pay close attention. So in a way, it's an exercise that we should all be doing in irrelevant of the uh, research, uh, our research subjects, but... Uh, yeah, this uh, doing this anthropology, sociology at home, it pushes pushes yeah. us. Yeah. So you said earlier that, that you can't, that there can't be a discussion on anything like um, representative samples and stuff like that. How does, uh, how does that come into play? How does the qualitative versus quantitative um, uh, debate act here? That's that exactly. This is a good question that feeds in the previous discussion of uh, the small sample and the responsibility that we have towards the small sample, because it would have been much easier to make analysis of uh, the level of uh, care in maternal and child health if we had more numbers simply representing the general situation and then taking a smaller case in which we uh, research the particularities. But it's extremely difficult to have numbers on these issues on Bulgaria and Romania. There is a, a statistical portal called uh, Peristat or Euro Peristat, I'm not sure, in which most countries submit numbers on different aspects. So not only the rate of C-sections, but also different type of interventions, different procedures done in the process of birth giving. 
Bulgaria and Romania provide only numbers on C-sections and Bulgaria provided also some strange number on instrumental delivery, which is not clear exactly what it means. It's open for interpretation. And the rest of it is simply not available. So even if hospitals have st- reliable statistics, they don't provide it in a national database, which in principle they should, uh, which leaves not only researchers like me in the dark and having to rely on qualitative research and on discussions and trying to make sense of trends based on uh, conversations. But also it means that at the policy level, which would mean introducing new medical standards, uh, developing guidelines and so on, there is no basis on which this could be done. This means that the people who should be responsible for developing these guidelines have no basis on which they can develop them. They don't know what's going on so that they can improve it or, you know, continue along the same lines. And I think this is a very serious problem when you com- I compare to a country like the UK, which has these universities and institutes of uh, nursing and midwifery, which uh, produce researchers who are uh, trained in medicine, but also in uh, research methods, and they produce a lot of research. And then on the basis of this research, decisions can be made, things can be changed, you know. So this is fully missing. And this is a problem not just for my own anthropological interest, but it's a problem of how you change a field. This means that you keep working with some outdated uh, numbers from who knows how many years ago. And then this, this forces us to go into small cases, very particular issues that can be researched by one person in one year, which is a limited approach, obviously. But even if we were five anthropologists or sociologists working on these issues, unless you have the also the big numbers, I am a strong believer in combining uh, different methods and making them uh, making sense of what's going on by combining statistical data with qualitative research. If you don't have the statistical data, it's very bad. Your your hands are tied. Yeah, well, I was I was wondering actually if I mean, uh, why did you choose to look at uh, these particular people who came back with the practice in particular places, and if maybe some change cannot be brought by with legal or like policy drafts or laws because like you said one of the problems is that uh, midwives they're actually not allowed or they do not have the power or they do not have the um, I don't know trust to do what they could uh, be doing so this is um, a legal problem it is a legal problem and in some places it gets solved through developing a national strategy or a protocol or a whatever you want to call it, in uh, Catalonia, I think, the the agency dealing with these issues developed a strategy and then developed a series of workshops and trainings and imposed it literally from above on midwives, on doctors, on hospital as a government strategy. So that's what we think you should be doing and you should do it. But we don't have these people in Bulgaria and Romania willing to do it. So there are no people in power, in the position of power, who would be interested in this. In Bulgaria, currently, for three years now or more, the medical standard is not functioning for a different reason, not related to birth giving, but uh, just to show you how numbers might work or not work, there was a... Uh, Bulgaria was on the last place of uh, child uh, mortality and morbidity in the EU and the way to change these numbers was to change the definition of what is birth and what is uh, abortion. So in the medical standard, the definition was changed from 600 grams and week 21, if I'm not mistaken, to 800 grams and week 24. I'm not sure about the weeks, but there was a raising of the limit. So then the definition was that a child is born if it weighs 800 grams after week 24 and it survives by uh, three days by itself. It doesn't need uh, additional care. This is early, you know, out of 40 weeks, 24 is quite early. Anything below is considered miscarriage or abortion. So it's not a child. So it doesn't go into the statistics of a child which died. 
So then one doctor took this uh, seriously uh, because also the implication of this is not only the difference in the in the care that a premature child uh, bo- uh, gets, but also it's in whether you have access to the body of the child or it's considered medical waste. And this is a big problem in Bulgaria that even if you want to have the body of uh, the fetus that was born, you don't have access to it because they say, but it's it's not a person. We don't qualify it as a person. It's medical waste. You can't have it. It, it gets burned. So it was from this more the position of trauma and psychological care for parents that this started, but she basically managed to win in the court at several uh, levels that this is illegal. So the standard was uh, upheld. And now for several years, there is no standard. In, in By law, they should have revised it and proposed a new version in six months or nine months, I don't know, but it's been years since. So this is the kind of uh, environment in which all of these processes are taking uh, Place the standard is not anyways. Uh, uh, it doesn't contain details on how uh, childbirth should proceed. This should be in guidelines, but even this general standard is not really available. So there are no people who would push for legal change. One of uh, um, one of the important things is that those midwives that I research are not only interested in providing a different type of uh, birthing experience for a limited number of women who can afford to pay uh, for a private hospital and who are in uh, the capital city and so on. But also they try to be part of working groups which discuss these things. They organize trainings for other midwives so that to teach them different skills that they don't learn in the university. So they are trying to um, change more than just their own individual practices as medical professionals, but you can only go that far from the position of a midwife. If you don't have partners at a higher level, institutional level, you don't have the influence. The good thing to say is that there is positive change. Change is happening until a few years, talking of the concrete changes that are taking place. Until a few years, women in state hospitals were strapped to a monitor, lying down on their backs without not being allowed to move, which makes contractions much more painful hence more tiring, hence a higher chance of the mother getting tired and then the baby getting in distress and then C-section, so that's one. They weren't allowed to drink water or eat food based on old recommendations that if there is a need of general anesthesia, this would compromise uh, the anesthesia and there is a risk of choking. But even in Bulgaria, anesthesiologists say this is not true anymore. Research shows that there is no such connection, there is no causal relationship. When women are not allowed to drink and eat, they get tired easier. So then again, the whole process of you get tired, the baby gets tired, doesn't get enough oxygen, C-section. So now they are more and more allowed. Fathers, doulas, other people are allowed to be present, which was also out of the question until recently, until a few years ago, exactly because the authoritative knowledge of the doctor should not have been questioned in any way, if you have other people, because the woman is giving birth and she's in uh, distress, but if there is a husband, you can't shout at the woman, you can't slap her in the face set, telling her not to shout as a doctor. I mean, you, you actually know that this is not acceptable. So fathers were not, or partners were not allowed, but now in many hospitals they are. Women are allowed to walk around. In some hospitals, they're even allowed to stand in different positions while pushing, but that's you know, <laughs> a bit uh, a bit too much for, for the state hospitals. Okay. But you see things actually really changing in the last few years. I mean, from an extreme case of uh, bad practices, things are, things are slowly, slowly changing. Not in all hospitals, not all doctors are doing. The numbers are still bad, but the fact that this change is taking place It's quite impressive. And then these particular women, the zebra midwives, um, they publish their statistics, unlike the other hospitals, and they've been working for three years now, and they have close to 300 births, which is a lot. They're just the two of them. And the numbers are impressive. Of course, they only work with low-risk women from a higher social status and, uh, you know, with resources. This, of course, helps to have 
better health outcomes. We know that. But still, all those women, if they went to a state hospital, would probably have had a completely different experience. Their number, their rate of C-sections is very low. Their rate of episiotomies, which is a standard in other hospitals, uh, is very low. Um, there are no uh, routine interventions. Interventions only happen if there is a need and so on. So there is a positive thing and change is happening. And that's why I'm interested in change and the agents of change rather than simply describing the bad practices and the bleak situation. It's just that it happens slow Slowly. and it only happens mostly for well-off middle-class women, which is the sad part. So we hope for the trickle-down effect, but let's hope that in yeah. <laughs> medicine it works better than in other fields. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just systematic as being middle class, you have access to more, better everything, so... Yeah, but until recently, even if you were middle class and uh, in a big city, you didn't have access to this. M women who I interviewed told me that before they discovered the zebra midwives, they were seriously considering going abroad to give birth in Austria, in Greece. So imagine if you're, you have the means, if you can consider spending weeks of your life to go somewhere else and to give birth somewhere else and to pay because you're not insured in this country. Imagine how dramatic the situation was from their point of view. So they could afford it, but they just couldn't get the care that they wanted. So the, the being middle class was not a guarantee that you'll get... Uh, good care in the way you want it. But now there is light in it. <laughs> Just as a little bit of light, yeah. We, I also read this article in um, in this magazine, the Kato Revisa, that said that there are there are uh, these things changing in Romania also with the midwives getting a little bit more attention and all well, these private hospitals in Bucharest in which you can actually have a better experience of giving birth. But indeed it's um, it's slow. And um, there are birds going on all the time. Yeah. But the idea is that if you prove that it's medically possible for women to give birth in such a way, then, middle class or not, you can then translate this easier at the level of policies and changing regulations. It seems to me that like you first have to show that it's possible to do it in Bulgaria or Romania and, then, and not only say, well, this is how it is in the UK. Ah, to this, make it possible in that place, in these places. In here. these places, to even if it's in private hospitals only and in small numbers, but say, look, it's working. And then you can maybe take the next step and push for more general um, changes from above. Great. But ask me again in three years. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, <coughs> but we will. Yeah. So thank you, Neda. Thank you. It was a pleasure <laughs> to talk about these issues at length. Thank you for listening to Contrasense. Today's guest was Neda Deneva. This week's episode was produced by Maria and Matei, soundtrack by Kind Studios, recorded at Radio EBS. This podcast is partly supported by the Faculty of Sociology and Social Work from the University of Pabesboy Cluj-Napoca. If you liked the episode, you can support us by donating to our Patreon, and a huge thank you to those who already do. You can find the link below. More about us on our Facebook page, and you can listen to us on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and most other podcasting apps. We're looking forward to your feedback and questions at contrasense at protonmail.com. That is C-O-N-T-R-A-S-E-N-S -E at protonmail.com. <laughs>